I'm Ryan Belgard, writer and director of Gremlin, and you're watching The 13th Wolfman. Ow! I'm proud of you for keeping it. You didn't have to. It was very brave of you. It's very simple. All you have to do is give the box to someone you love. Pass it along. Do it before the timer runs out. Grandma Mary's dead. What happened? This is attached to me somehow. It's a curse or something. I don't understand it. But I have to get it out of this house before it kills every one of us. There's too many missing people and dead bodies. The only thing that's consistent with anyone's story is this damn magic box. What happens when this timer runs out? I don't know! Maybe it finally comes for you. Like, your time is up. Come on! everybody, I'm the 13th Wolfman, and you know who I have with me today on Sit Down? I have the director and the writer of Gremlin. Not Gremlins, we're not talking Joe Dante, we're talking Ryan Bilgart. Uh, it's a 2017 movie with, uh, with a very cool twist to it. Welcome to Sit Down, Ryan. I am so glad to be here, thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, like I said earlier when we were talking, uh, I really dug this movie, it, rem it reminded me of... You know, this really bizarre chain letter, you know, that was fashioned around like a Dybbuk box, but also like the game Hot Potato, because you only had so much time to pass it on. Yeah, I, the story um, was kind of born out of, uh, a, a little bit out of uh, necessity, but also a little bit of just kind of some me just sort of trying to think of like the most painful way to, to try to get rid of a curse. Uh, the reason we used the box was because we were originally doing a short film and we wanted to um, show uh, just a few special effect shots of some kind of a creature. So we thought it'd be clever to have the box be in the most of the movie and then just show the creature at the end. That way we didn't have to do very many visual effect shots. But once we decided to go into um, making it into a feature, I kept uh, trying to think about like, okay, so you've got this curse on you and what's, what would be the hardest and most like horrible way to get rid of it. And I can't think of anything worse than having to pass it along to someone that you truly loved and pass it on to them. And uh, that's the only way. And so, and, and otherwise the box is like completely indestructible uh, or you can't kill it. You can't throw it in the lake. You can't give it to just anybody. I mean, there was only one real specific thing you had to do to pass it along. And even then you weren't safe because if that person you passed it to loved you back, it could come right after you too. So it was just sort of a, an unwinnable situation for our characters, which was, which made it kind of, for me, a fun script to write. Yeah, and it's a very cool looking box. I mean, it's got this it's got this old world look to it, but it's also got the very cool timer. I don't know for lack of a better word, which yeah, looked, looked really really neat. I mean, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I I designed it. It was kind of a neat how we came up with that thing. I I uh, designed it in a three D program, you know, in Maya, which is our the special effects program we use a lot. And I designed it, and it was just at that point, it was just gray. And then uh, I sent it over to our prop builder, a guy named Emilio, and he lives in Belgium. And I sent the 3D model over to him, and he then 3D printed it out, which was really cool. And so we had like a physical, actual physical uh, representation of it. And then when he sent it back to me, I used um, rub and buff, which is like this metallic paint stuff, you know. And I just sort of like buffed it and painted it to make it look uh, kind of like old metal. And then, then I took like high resolution pictures of my texture that I painted on the actual box, and then I map those onto my 3d model so that way i had a 3d version of the box a digital version of the box and i had also a practical version of the box that were exactly the same and it worked really great and it's kind of interchangeable in the movie i mean sometimes it's practical sometimes it's digital and it worked really well uh, that way but 
we tried to make an actual like working functional practical dial, you know, uh, for the yeah. for the mechanism on top of it. And we had a guy like sticking his hand up inside of it and twisting something to try to make it turn. And it just like looked it looked too janky. We couldn't get it like really smooth and and moving in the way we wanted to because we wanted it to look like it was futuristic and impossible to to move, you know, and and. Um, and uh, like the gearing inside would have to be like really complex or something. And we just couldn't figure out how to do that practically. So we kind of resorted to a more a, a CG approach to the way that dial and the timer worked. Where did the, so I, I love that timer, but the, the markings. Uh, now is that, is that something that you came up with or yeah. did you just, did you take something out of a book or? No, I just, I just doodled them. I mean, I, I just kind of like, they don't really mean much. They were just sort of like, kind of like I call I guess I call it variations on a circle <laughs> you know I just kind of like found a, a circle uh, shape and just sort of started pulling little pieces around and just decided to come up with little interesting looking looking letters I mean the, the reason I wanted them to be, look like that or like not I didn't want them to be Latin or Aramaic or something I, I just wanted them to be like alien you know because I, I wanted the box I wanted the box's origins to be mysterious like is this an ancient culture? Is it an alien culture? Like we don't really know or or really find out what it is. But I liked the idea that uh, it was it was from some you know some some. And I actually had like I had written a pretty intense backstory uh, that was like three or four pages long of where the creature came came from and how it came to be on Earth and and uh, how it became to be trapped inside this box. And the part of the movie where they kind of explain that backstory, and if you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about, where they kind of go into the backstory, right, in the book thing, um, that was going to be all that that I originally wrote. But we sort of left that for the end of the movie, like after it was all uh, edited and put together, because I thought, well, rather than go into this like really detailed and in-depth backstory, it'd probably be better to save that part for any exposition that maybe by the time people are watching this, they're confused about the rules or they need to be like reminded of something specific we can reiterate that in this little part, this little animated part of the movie. And I'm happy with the way it turned out because we simplified it a lot. But what was cool, though, was that I, I, I had that backstory. So I was able to kind of like think of that and, and it kind of inspired a lot of the things that the monster does. And maybe it's not completely clear why it does some of the things he does in the film. It, maybe it's a little bit of a mystery, but to me it's like everything it's doing has a real, it has a real reason for why it's doing, even at the end when it does what it does. Like I kind of see that a certain way. It might not be, you know, it's, it's all there if you if you kind of pay attention to it. But to me, the end to me is that he's more King Kong than Godzilla at the end. He's not just like on a rampage tearing everything up. He's more like trying to defend himself because, uh, you know, you yeah. know, not to give too much away, but he's like released. You know, right. yeah, I know uh, those uh, those markings. Remind, I mean, you said you came up with them yourself, but in a way, in some cases, they kind of remind me of Ruin Stones. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, sure. I, I, right, just um, yeah, some something dwarvish writing from Lord of the Rings or something, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I was thinking of like the Celtic ruins that you know you would mm -hmm. see, you know. Yeah. But yeah, just just something that that's a lost culture, a lost language, you know. Right. Yeah, I mean, maybe subconsciously, but I because of the circular nature of the of, of passing the box around and the circular nature of the hole on top of the box and stuff. I just thought kind of doing things in, in a circle would be kind of, I don't know, for some reason I like, I like doing themes around shapes and, I, and it was just something I thought would be cool to keep it sort of keep those ruins kind of circular, you know? That makes sense though. I mean, since the, since the mechanism is round, why wouldn't the shapes around the mechanism also be a uh, circular nature? Right. You know? Yeah. yeah. You know, it's it funny. I never thought about that at all until right now. So <laughs> we made a breakthrough. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's kind of funny. It makes you think after a while you're like, wow. How long has this box been being passed? I mean, is it is it only been on the on the planet for two days, or has it been here for two well, million years? Yeah. You know? So, like it, in my backstory that I wrote for it, it's been here for thousands of years, and the original backstory is is um, and I, I mean, hopefully your your viewers would would find this interesting. But the original the original backstory was thousands of years ago. This being, you know, in this huge form sort of like came either from a parallel dimension or from space or somewhere, but it was injured. And so like some tribesmen nursed the uh, creature back to health. And then as a reward, the creature gave this man knowledge of technology to build, um, to, that, that he used to build this box to, to then trap the creature. 
So then he built this box using the creature's technology and trapped it and decided to use it as like a weapon against the warring tribe on his island or whatever. So he knew that if he gave it to the people, his enemies, the clan of his enemies, that they would pass it all around between the people that they loved. And then, and then so he would be safe and all this. So I had this like really complicated, you know, uh, backstory. But basically the idea here to me was that when someone possessed the box, they started to kind of go, go mad. And they, right. they, were, they were sort of like, um, at, they never let the timer run out because they always became too cowardly to do that, you know? And, um, and I think, so in, in our film, it, it's the first time that maybe it's ever actually run out all the way because every other time for thousands of years, someone has passed it along uh, to somebody, you know? And it's just, it's just gone from family to family to family to family across continents and islands and generations. And that's kind of how I always imagined it. Yeah, I'm just I'm just thinking about how many, you know, how many bodies in this wake there have been in like two thousand years, you know, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> you know, so let's talk a little bit about that. Where you got the inspiration for this movie? You know, um, what well, you know, I, I boy, it's I'm not. I don't really know. It was. It was kind of like I, I like the movie. It follows. I remember that. I like the idea of a curse that would like follow people around. Uh, um, I liked. I liked the idea of. Um, I've always liked creatures. I, I've kind of been doing CG animation for a hobby for about ten years or so. So a lot of it was like I want to just like see if I can do a CG creature, you know, like this in a movie. And uh, you know, I wanted to keep the story small and personal. So. I'm not so sure that it's like necessarily influenced by very specific movies or very specific stories, but I can tell you that I've always loved, um, you know, I've always loved popcorn movies. I'm a kid. I'm kind of an eighties kid and grew up loving stuff like, um, you know, everything from the Goonies to alien to, you know, big trouble in little China, John Carpenter, Steven Spielberg, like all, all of those kind of movies are the movies that, um, I kind of grew up watching. My dad would show me those kind of movies when I was really, when I was 10 years old, you know, he'd show me, Alien. It, it scared me to death at the time, but I mean, um, stuff like that, or, or even B movies like Night of the Comet and stuff like that. We would watch oh. together, and and so like I've always kind of had this like, uh, oh, what's the one? Uh, like even fantasies like Kroll or or um, Beastmaster. I remember watching a lot when I was younger. Um, but like these fantasies and these and these movies that were escapism movies were the movies I always was drawn to and that I loved, and I think even now. Um, like I remember watching Jurassic Park in the theater probably like 20 times or something because to me I was just so blown away by how they could make that look so real to me and and it was like you're totally going to a new place and and so that's my favorite thing that I love about films and movies is that they are escapism and they're entertainment and you can just sort of like be transported for two hours to somewhere else completely new and, and or somewhere where something exists that doesn't exist in the real world. And that's why I, in my movies that my team and I get to do, I feel like I always want to do that is create some kind of a, some kind of an escapism, you know, and some kind of like our next movie is a combination of like Jurassic Park and Running Man. And I, I'm really excited about that. Cause it's just, it's just kind of like, you know, dinosaurs meets death row inmates in a futuristic game show. And it's just like all, those kind of like sort of uh, genre mashing kind of uh, movies are really, really fun to make. But at the end of the day, for me, it's just about entertainment and, and um, having a movie that people can, you know, watch and maybe argue about it or or um, or just enjoy it are the kind of kind of things that I'm trying to do. Yeah. No. I, so were you a, I mean, were you a child of the 80s or were just raised on that kind of stuff? I mean, I was born in 1975. So, yeah. OK, so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was around around, uh, you know, I, I remember seeing uh Back to the Future in the theater in 1985. Uh, Same I, remember, I remember seeing, um, let's see what else, Teen Wolf I remember seeing. I remember seeing Empire Strikes Back. I think Empire Strikes Back might have been the first movie I can actually remember seeing in the theater. Uh, that would have been 1982, 19, maybe? 19, 1980. And so 1980, yeah. yeah. So I was like five, you know. But I can yeah. remember seeing I remember seeing that movie in a drive-in theater with my parents uh, very young. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I grew, up, I, I grew up on that stuff. But my dad, you know, had a, had a pretty massive um, collection of like betas and, and VHSs and he had, you know, each machine and he would go rent movies all the time. I tell you, man, one thing I really miss is the, is the video store, you know? I know. And, it, and it's like, I just don't think you get that now. And it's sad. I mean, there's, there's one or two family videos around where I live, but I mean, just, I remember 
going to Blockbuster Video or wherever and, um, you know, picking up things and just browsing the covers and looking at things that I'd never seen before and just thought they were interesting, picking up the cover and just having that tangible thing is a, is something that I like really cherish. And I'm glad, that, I'm glad it's still there in some, in some degree, but sadly it kind of feels like it's going away. I, you, know, you know, we have this, we have this debate around the dorkening all the time. Um, I know Leo feels that, that somewhere down the road, it's going to be more or less streaming. I don't think, I honestly don't feel that it's ever get physical media is ever going to really go away because there's people like myself and Kevin and Tony who are collectors. You can, yeah. I mean, you don't have it behind me right now, but if you watch my other videos, it's just this crazy collection behind me with, with a King Kong movie poster and stuff like that. And I'm talking 1933 King Kong movie poster. Yeah. You know, not that, that thing that, Jackson thinks was was a movie. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't like that one? No. Nah. Oh, man. What did you think of the latest one? Uh, did you watch that, Kong Skull Island? Dude, that was a good movie. You like that one? That was a good movie. Yeah, I, I actually really enjoyed The thing that bugged me about, about Peter Jackson is uh, a lot of times his movies are... It's a very simplified story that doesn't need to be... King Kong did not need to be three hours and plus long. <laughs> You know, yeah, yeah. it's like oh, I, I could make a three-hour movie. But you don't need to, especially especially for a movie that you already know the ending to, right? <laughs> yeah, the original. I think the original was only like an hour and eighteen minutes long, or something like that. So yeah, I mean, really, wow. Yeah, I remember. I remember liking the old uh, nineteen. I think it was nineteen seventy-eight King Kong, the Jessica Lange one or Jeff Bridges That's one. 1976, yeah. Yeah, I I, uh, I remember really liking that one. That's another one that I liked a lot and watched a lot as a kid with my dad. That was a very cool movie. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I love that one, too, and that's the one that kind of gets skipped over because it's not the Empire State Building, it's the Twin Towers. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I really, I, I, man, and I appreciate, I really appreciate, uh, I'm glad I got to see a lot, of the, a lot of those movies growing up because it made me, I think, really appreciate kind of like what goes into making movies and understanding like how, Harry Harryhausen used armatures or how Peter Jackson used the things that he did, whether it was practical effects or, or special effects or whatever. And, and, um, you know, for, for me and, and, and my team here, I mean, it's like, we just, we just, we work with very modest budgets and, uh, we try to just use every single tool at our disposal to be able to bring our, our films together. And it is a lot of times very much a duct tape failing wire kind of approach, you know, where we're just like really, pulling together anything we, we possibly can. And people ask me all the time whether I prefer digital or practical. And I'm, my answer is always like, hey, I, I just, I prefer what I can do, like what I can actually make happen. Um, you know, and they're all, like the tools to do digital um, effects are, are uh, you know, readily accessible. And, you know, one thing that my sales agent told me when we were putting uh, this together, I was like, you know, would it be better to do like a puppet or a guy in a suit? Um, or would it be better to do a little CG creature or whatever? And, and he's like, he goes, look, man, he goes, um, I'm telling you, like, unless you can do the puppet or the CG creature, like, as good as the guys, the best, you know, Jim Henson creature shop or Stan Winston or those guys, right. he's like, don't do it because, like, you'll, it'll look really, really bad, you know, and he's right. I mean, this, we tried to do some, we did a little bit of work with a practical gremlin puppet for this movie because I thought, well, maybe in the close-ups I could have, like, a practical puppet and um, it looked cool because I could put slime all over it and blood all over it and stuff and we did some tests with it and... It did look pretty cool. I, I liked it. We had a we had a, our, our prop builder build us a puppet version of it, but the problem was is that um, it took a long time to get it to work right on set and shoot, and so it was costing us a lot of time. I had three puppeteers that were trying to move the thing around, and it just like it was still like kind of stiff and kind of like puppety, you know, if that makes sense. So um, now you know the the way the light hit it, the way that the slime looked, that was great, but. Uh, that's stuff that's hard hard to reproduce in CG, but um, the CG one is what we went with in the end because I was able to make it do what I wanted it to do in the movie, which was have a lot more range of motion and run up and down walls and crawl inside of things that a puppet or a marionette just wouldn't have been able to do. So, yeah. But that doesn't mean I don't like uh, practical puppets, and I, I love that stuff. Um, but I do know that it's like I actually did uh, contact um, a, a prominent shop in Los Angeles about doing creature effects like that, and it's just like, way, way, way out of our price range. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, well, you probably, you're more likely, you're a child of the 80s, so you're more likely have seen Poltergeist. Oh, yeah. And I don't think anything could look as bad as that giant dinosaur puppet thing that they got. 
I love that movie, but that's yeah. every time I watch that movie, it's the one scene that bugs me. Yeah, that's I'm what like, you mean. I'm like, wow, this just looks so bad. I love that movie too, and I remember that, I remember the scene you're talking about. Uh, um, but you know, I, I, for some reason, I was watching ET recently, and I was like, you know, I, the ET monster looks okay, but he doesn't look. You know, it's tough. I mean, it's like I think people are really nostalgic for that stuff, but then when if you look at it again, kind of. And, and analyze it now by today's standards. It looked like it looked like a little rubber guy walking around in a suit, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so. No, yeah, I, I, yeah, it's it's funny. It's like I mean, I'm a big horror fan. I love all kinds of movies. Don't get me wrong, but horror is my number one love. And again, we we talk about you know the the future of of film, and you know they got 4K out now, mm-hmm. and I, I, I'm never going to jump to 4K. As much as I love Blu-ray, I mean, I, I'm good here because if I go to 4K, we're going to start seeing the, the zippers and the suits, <laughs> for sure. you know, and, and it's going to completely blow the, the magic of illusion for those horror films of the 70s and 80s. Uh, you, make a, you make a great point. Yeah, that, that, that's really true. You know, and, and we're... You know, we're, 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 we do our, we film our movies in 4K and we, and, um, and, and because the, for distribution, because of like certain markets and territories, they want it, you know, um, oh, that's so, right. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, like, but you know, when, when Gremlin comes out on DVD, that's good old standard definition. You know, that's, uh, I think, what is it like, uh, 640 by 480 or something like that. Not even close to 4K. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, like I said, I mean, it, that's just that's always what I think because you mentioned a movie I love to death, and that's Night of the Comet. Mm-hmm. Well, look at try to look at Night of the Comet in four K. It's just, <laughs> yeah, it's not going to work. Um, no. But I, I, I'm not saying don't go ahead with four K. I'm saying you know that this is this is my reasoning for me not getting into it. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I, I, hey man, I, I, I get you. Plus, you've already got a big library of what you got on your stuff yeah. already. So yeah, it makes it makes doesn't make sense to buy it all again, you know. And, and honestly, like the difference between watching a Blu-ray on your TV and watching something in 4K on your TV, I'm not really so sure you're seeing. Like, a, there's a certain threshold where your human like vision can only detect so much resolution. Right. You know, I would think so. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I saw a friend post on on Facebook the other day. He said um, he, got, he posted. Uh, VHS, and then he said, and then DVD came out, and someone and someone said, oh, but it looks better than VHS. And he goes, now Blu-ray came out, and he goes, yes, but it looks better than DVD. And he goes, now 4K came out, and he goes, yeah, but it looks better than Blu-ray. He goes, where do we stop? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I know. It's, yeah. it's a cool idea. I mean, I, like I said, for for movies nowadays, sure, film yeah. 4K. But well, you know, I, and. I, I'm kind of a technical guy, so I mean, I do like the technical side of it, and I like, I mean, I love learning about cameras and the latest, you know, cameras and lenses and techniques and software and all that stuff, so that stuff does fascinate me, um, and, but at the, you know, really when it's all said and done for us, it's like, you know, uh, all that stuff are just tools to try to tell the best story that you can, and we're always really more worried, I'm always more worried about what's on front of, in front of the camera than I am, you know, like, when I said what camera or what lens or, or whatever, but, um, but I think the thing is, is, uh, you know, I, I talk to a lot of film students and, and things like that. And they always ask me like, what camera are you using and how are you putting it all together and everything? And I, and I, and I, my advice to them is like, Hey, just, just learn how to like use lighting and learn how to use composition and learn how to tell a story and cut between characters talking correctly. And, like learn how to do that first, and then and then once you get, uh, you could shoot that on like your phone, and it, it would look great. But um, you know, once you get your hands on some nicer tools, then of course you can you can use them, and they'll make your your projects look better and better. But um, but I'm with you, man. I mean, the technology is one thing, but the but I really like to focus on on um, trying to capture a, a unique moment or story that gets people to you know talk about it, and that's. I, I love it. Like good review or bad review. I love the idea that people talk about it and think about it and have some, have something to say about what we did. It made, that's really cool to me. Yeah. The, the number one, I mean, it's, it's been getting better the last few years, but when I first started watching like a lot of independent horror, the one thing that was awful was sound. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
No one could figure out how to do sound, and I'm like, really? You just hire somebody that can do it really good. That's that's what you do. I'll tell you, yeah, well, sure, um, but uh, it's overlooked. It's often overlooked, and I think the problem is is that it's, 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 to hire someone to do it really good, it's, it's expensive, you know? Uh, I actually came from a sound background and, and did sound before I did movies, oh, wow. so, so I, had, um, I had a recording studio, and I worked in radio for a long time, so I, um, I had a lot of um, knowledge in, like, mixing for music, so... I've mixed the audio on both of our films so far, and you're right. Having someone really good come record it is a big help because that way you don't have to fix a lot, you know, so much of it later. But I think you're absolutely right. Like bad sound can totally uh, destroy a movie and and take you out of it completely. Where I think bad video can be forgiven more if the sound is really good. Exactly. Yeah. No, I, I've seen I have seen like movies that would I'm like. God, that movie, the story was great, but I couldn't hear half the crap that was going on because, you know, the, the person turned away from the microphone, which was over here, or yeah. uh, they, they just, they, yeah. they're not wired, or I, I don't know. They got, they got, like, they got like the Nine Inch Nails soundtrack playing way too loud, Yeah, you know? Well, it's just as important as the visual part, and it takes just as long to edit an, um, a, a, a movie sound than it does... You know, it, it takes me a few months, three months or so uh, for our films to do all the sound editing and mixing. And it's a big, long, complicated process, but if you don't pay attention to it, then you're absolutely right. It's going to ruin the movie. Is there anything you don't, is there any hat you don't wear while they, I mean, your writer, producer, director, editor, I mean, sound? Yeah, you know, <laughs> Well, when you put it that way, it makes me it makes me sound like I do a lot of and I do I, I do but like what I what I did is I like being where I live in, in Oklahoma City. I was a freelance video producer for for a while, and I just realized that I needed to keep adding to my skill set so that I could keep working. And so I kept learning. I learned things like music editing and video editing, and you know, camera, and and then I got into three D animation and things like that. And I've always loved storytelling, so that that was something I've done ever since I was little. Was trying to write and come up with stories, but um, but you know, I, I found that I kind of got to a place where it was neat that I could sort of like understand all those different disciplines. But I wasn't; it was more like a jack of all trades, master of none kind of situation. And it became apparent that I needed to surround myself with people that were a lot better than me. And so once I sort of like realized filmmaking is like an extremely collaborative process and you need to have a great team around you. And the minute that I found a director of photography that was better than me and an editor that was better and, you know, musicians that were better and like, um, you know, I have CG artists now that are helping me that are, they're better than what I can do. Like then all of a sudden the projects like get elevated to a level that I could never have imagined them being elevated to because there's people that are so talented working on them. And I think that the thing I've been very fortunate to be able to do is kind of get these guys on board and say, Here's the vision. Here's like here's what we're all working on. Here's how we can accomplish it. And since I kind of know what you're doing or kind of understand how you do your thing, I can relate to you, and we can sort of work this out together. Where I understand, I understand it takes a long time to do what you're doing. I've I've tried to do it, so I think I can sort of I can sort of like um, help encourage and inspire these guys to to like make something that when it all comes together, like this, you know, it's, what's the expression? It's greater than the sum of its parts, sort of. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and the cool thing is, is that being so, I mean. I've I self ta- I've self taught myself uh, self taught myself <laughs> I've self taught uh, I've learned video editing my just just getting a video editing program and teach mm-hmm. right and there's a point to where you, you where you get where you get where you're like okay I know how to do this 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 and this I'm comfortable there you know you find your comfort zone but when you get someone around you that that's a little bit higher up the food chain. You get to learn from them, so yeah. now you're now now you're no longer just sitting at a, at a comfort zone. You're going, okay, I they're helping me, but I'm learning too, so I could do that next time. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things I truly believe is if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. You know, I I really I really want to learn uh, and get better in each of my movies. I want to be able to to, to make them um, on a more like you know just professional level each time and get get uh you know in every aspect of it from the storytelling to the acting to the editing and the visual effects and the music and everything i just want to keep upping the game every time and to do that um the only way to do that i think is just to do it is just to keep making keep making them and learn from the mistakes and and um 
I, mean, I, listen to, I listen to feedback. I listen to reviews. I listen to what audiences say and then try to learn from all that stuff. But one thing I, I've, I've realized is like, I don't, I don't want to let that stuff define me, you know, saying like what other people say about it or whatever, good or bad. Um, I, you know, I kind of choose what to listen to. And I still think that um, there's still, I'm still going to do them the way that I feel like they should be done. But I do like to listen to feedback and, and like to uh, try to incorporate things. Like, for example, if like five reviews in a row say something like, you know, very specific, then I'm going to look really hard at that and be like, okay, that's something I should do better. I need to work on. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not yeah. going to get mad. I'm just like, this is an actual thing that I can use to learn to get better, you know? And that's, that's a good thing. I mean, we all, we all got to learn. We all got to get better. Yeah. But yeah. No, that's, that's, that's great. Um, so when does this, when does Gremlin come out? Uh, Gremlin comes out on VOD July 11th. So as far as I know, it's on like the, like all the streaming services and, you know, uh, like Amazon iTunes and then like the in demand stuff. I think it comes out on, uh, on all those things, July 11th. And then later on, there'll be a disc release. I don't know the date on that one yet. So we just we just finished recording like the director's commentary and some special behind the scenes stuff. So the the DVD will have some extra stuff that you know you won't be able to get anywhere else, which is cool. Okay, I love commentaries. I, it's honestly one of my favorite things when it comes to when it comes to getting discs. You know, as, but can you get a second commentary in with some of the actors? Because I also like to hear the stories that they have to deal with. Well, you'll like this. You'll like ours then, because we did our, our commentary was actually with me, and then um, a couple of our uh, my other partners, Andy and Josh. Who Andy was the DP, or sorry, Josh was the DP, and Andy was the editor. But we also had Adam Hampton, who was the lead actor. Too. Okay. So our, our commentary has four guys on it, and uh, Adam and I talk a lot about the actor's perspective, and he talks a lot about playing his character and kind of what he brought to the picture because he, he did actually a lot more than just act, act the character. I actually wrote that part for him. He's a local actor that, that does a lot of great work. And I knew he could, I knew he could sort of carry the weight of this father in this story. And I mean, even I was even so lazy about it that I didn't change his name. Uh, it was just Adam and the his real name was Adam too. And is Adam in the movie? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but, um, but he, he was awesome uh, going through the story with me and helping me sort of, um, iron out some of the problems in the story and he's, he's just really a great guy to work with and a great actor and, and he's a great writer and director himself but um, I think the, the I think you'll, if you enjoy commentaries I hope you'll enjoy ours because uh, it does have like the, some technical stuff but it also has a lot of like from the actor's perspective and just a lot of different perspectives in that one commentary yeah, I, track. I, I, like, I, I, think it's, I think it works better when you have like some of the actors and not just all, because I've heard some of those commentaries where you just get the, all the technical guys there kind of like sitting there talking about, yeah, I did this on this and you know, yeah. and you're just kind of going, yeah, did anything else happen? You know, and then right. they start watching the movie and they're like, oh yeah, we got to talk too because we're watching the movie. <laughs> no, we, we talked the whole time. We had a lot of stories to tell. I think, I think most of our commentary is, is, um, just reminiscing about um, fun stories and things like, you know, we would say like, oh, on this scene, this, this happened behind the scenes or this was a funny day for this reason or there was a lot of laughing. I remember there being a lot of laughing and a lot of, we had a lot of fun doing that commentary. But it's also, yeah, there's some tech stuff in there where our DP chimed in and said, yeah, I, I really, um, you know, appreciated the fact that we put this light here, that light there. And I think we made fun of him when he said that. So that didn't, that didn't last too long. <laughs> How long is this movie? I mean, from from conception to to final cut, how long? Oh, it was fast. Um, we did it. We started in January 2016 with the script, and then we were casting in February. We shot it in March, and we were in post from March until November. And in November of 2016, we took it to the American film market, and um, we that's where we secured uh, some distribution deals with with our different territories, but uh, the whole final thing was done in December of uh, 2016. So about, it, we did it in about 11 months. So it was pretty quick. Wow. That is, that is pretty quick. We, we've been having some people on lately that it's like, you'll hear someone go, yeah, it took us five years to put that movie out. Totally. I, I can see that. I mean, we, we work at a production company that does a lot of video work for all kinds of different types of clients, not just feature film work. So, you know, my team is like pretty efficient and we had already gone through our first movie that we did Army of Frankenstein's took us about 18 months to put together. And we learned a lot from that one. And we just learned how to like, 
it's, it's really cool. I mean, I love working with a team where you sort of have this unspoken language and like they know what kind of shots I want. I know what they need to do to make them happen. I mean, it was, we, we can just sort of look at each other and they know, we know what we need to do. We can work really, really fast and, and blow through our schedules, I think in a good, uh, a good efficient amount of time. So, um, you know, we're, we're able to, we're able to get stuff done. Uh, but you know, the, the post work, like the gremlin creature itself took hours and days and months to uh, put that together. That was the hardest part of the movie was putting the gremlin creature in it. You yeah. Know, it I, would, I mean, when you were talking about all the things that you do, you know, and you said, Oh yeah, I learned 3d, you know, 3d art. I'm like, there's no way. I just, I, I know what my set skills are at and, I can't draw to save my life, let alone draw on a computer. <laughs> I, can't, I can't draw either. I can't draw. I can't draw either. But the, I mean, there's ways. I mean, I'll, I'll put it this way, I guess. And I, I can't think of another way to put it. But there's ways to cheat, you know. And um, like, you can take some if you're working with a real modest budget. You know, you can you can like you can find creatures. Like you know how there's like stock images, like st stock photo websites. You can find yeah. stock 3D creatures too. And so there are places where you can download you can download digital assets like creatures or police cars or whatever. And um, so we found our gremlin creature that way, and we didn't didn't have to pay very much at all to use the model of the creature. Now we had to rig it up for animation and do all the animating. So we spent months and months working with it. But the actual creature design itself was something that we found. And sort of a cool thing I found out later was that that creature, the, the design of the gremlin in our movie was a rejected design from the Thing movie, the remake. Oh. And so there was a CG modeler, CGI modeler, who modeled this creature for uh, to present as a concept for the Thing movie. And then when it was rejected, it was then put up on that website for us to use it and download it. So, hey, man, I mean, uh, you know, I not necessarily want to, like, share this everywhere, but I guess it doesn't matter. I mean, if you, if you wanted to download that creature and make your own movie with it, you could, <laughs> you know. So... Yeah. Actually, remind me. Um, there was a failed TV show in the late '90s, I believe it was late '90s, early 2000s, called Invasion. And mm. and I remember that one? Yeah, it it was like I think it lasted 15, 16 episodes. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was this little creature that uh, a pair of kids were trying to keep from the government from finding. And oh yeah, and uh, it kind of had a similar look. Really, not 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 a hundred percent, but I mean, if I'm remembering it right, I I believe it had a similar look. I'll have to yeah. check that out. Invasion. That sounds that sounds pretty cool. Yeah. Well, so when it does, uh, you said you said it could come out on DVD. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there going to be a Blu-ray, or you're not sure? I'm not sure. I I think so. I think there will be. Um, but I don't. You know, they haven't given me the um. The details on that on that yet i know there i know there'll be discs and i know like our distributor is uncorked and i know that uncorked is very ex uh, excited about the about the movie and they've been super cool I, I love i love working with those guys they're just the coolest guys ever and if you kind of look at their other releases they do sort of like um dvd release and they do they do blu-ray releases too so right. i would imagine they will uh but but sometimes they don't I don't really ask them. I just kind of like watch and wait and see what happens. And but um, I do know they're doing a disc because they've asked us to provide stuff like commentaries and behind the scenes stuff for it. So that's cool. Yeah, I look look forward to seeing look forward to seeing that uh, Army of Frankenstein's. I loved that movie. Man, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. You know what's funny is I've had there's been a few people that have said they've liked Army of Frankenstein's and didn't like Gremlin at all. Could you, because that, do you sort of, could, I think maybe it's because they sort of expected well, Gremlin to be kind of campy like Army of Frankensteins, and I didn't go that way with it. I went a different way. I, I yeah, that, that could be, I, but Army of Frankenstein felt more like a horror movie. Mm. Oh, really? Whereas, whereas Gremlin feels, I mean, it, it's got a, it's got horror elements to it, but it feels more sci-fi-y. Oh, okay. You know, so you might. You might be talking to hardcore horror fans. They're like, "Dude, I want more horror." You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and with me, like I said before, I I love like all kinds of movies, and this this was definitely you know, hot potato and chain letter, Dybbuk box type thing. I just loved. Oh, thanks a lot. Well, I really, I really did want to um, do something that was a departure, kind of creatively from Army of Frankenstein's because Army of Frankenstein's was was sort of the project that we did. 
that was a, certainly like a, a labor of love type thing and just a kind of a fun project we were doing on nights and weekends because we just wanted to for fun. And, you know, we had sort of this campiness about it and, and um, you know, and but before I go too much further, you're not thinking about Frankenstein's Army, are you? The Richard Rathorst movie? Because that, that's no. kind of a horror movie. Okay. No, that's- Okay, I, I know I, I know I know both of them, but no. Okay, yeah. good because I mean I know people I know people have made that made that uh, confusion before, and I'm like, wait a minute, you're talking about the other <laughs> movie I didn't make, but um, I guess that's the risk I run by naming movies uh, almost exactly like other ones, right? But um, but no, we went with sort of a campy direction with Army of Frankenstein's, and you know we knew that when we screened it with audiences that it got moans and groans and laughter and stuff like that, and with Gremlin, I was more like. I want to know if I can, can I make an audience uncomfortable? Can I make them like, um, you know, uh, sad or scared or nervous or, so I think, I think as a storyteller, it was more about like with Gremlin, I was like, I want to see if I can tell a story that's, that's dark and sort of this like psychological drama or horror that this family is going through is like kind of like the primary focus, the creatures there and it's killing everyone doing all that stuff. But I really loved the idea that like this dad was going through like, this most horrible unimaginable scenario and it was that was the part to me that was like really fun to to write and explore and do something different from army of frankenstein which was more of sort of a time traveling adventure kind of horror right. thing yeah this this had more dread to it yeah 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 it's a, it's yeah. a good movie and i'm i'm going to tell everyone right now that's that's going to be watching us when i put it up uh you got to check it out man you got to check out gremlin yeah i mean you're, you're on fire with this. This is a very good movie. It's worth checking out when it comes out on VOD July 11th. When they put out the disc, uh, we'll find out when that is, and we'll make sure we share that to the world. Um, I want to thank you for coming on Sit Down. Uh, if, if people are looking for you on social on the social network, where can they find you? Well, thank you for having me. And like I said, um, I think it was before we went on the, the air with it, I... I'm really, really grateful that you've given me the chance to be to come on here and spend so much time talking to, talking with me, talking about our movies and and just about movies in general. It's really cool and uh, kind of a dream come true that I get to do this do this kind of stuff. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be on here. So thank you very much. If you, if, if anybody wants to find me on Facebook, um, it's real easy. You can just find me at uh, Ryan Belgart. It's just it's just search that or go, or put that in there and it'll pop right up. But uh, also. Uh, Facebook slash Gremlin movie is our Gremlin fan page that you or Gremlin Facebook page that you can go on there and, and like that too. So, um, and we'll, we'll be posting, you know, links to updates and things like or reviews and updates and news and stuff like that on there. So that'd be a good place to go. So anyway, I really enjoyed talking to you, man. I, I'm, I'm uh, kind of sad that we have to hang up cause I feel like we could go on and on and on. <laughs> oh, don't worry. I'm going to be on the live show. So, oh, good. Talk, okay. you know, <laughs> but yeah, so, so for, like I said again, man, Gremlin is a movie worth watching. Please check it out when it comes out on VOD. For Ryan Belgar, I'm the 13th Wolfman, and of course, I'm on the prowl. <laughs>